Stay connected to the world with Channels TV podcast and get all the trending stories. Simply log on to channelstv.com, click on podcast, select the program of your choice and listen. Our podcast is available on Apple, Google and Spotify. Tap the expertise you trust. Touch the stories that touch you anytime, anywhere. The Ninth House of Representatives has invited stakeholders for a conversation on policing and human rights in Nigeria. The dialogue takes a look at the proposed bill for the Police Service Commission, whose responsibility it is to sanction erring police officers. What we are about to discuss here is very important because in that act, there have not been any provision for any erring police officer who have goes beyond his core mandate. There have not been provision for sanction. This dialogue is an innovative step in the bill-making process. It is aimed at introducing stakeholder ownership of the legislative process. In emphasizing the need for police reforms, the UNDP resident representative to Nigeria and the Speaker of the House of Representatives speak on the disconnect between the citizens and the police. If you ask or talk to many citizens, which I've been had an opportunity to engage recently, there's a huge deficit in police and policing in Nigeria. We do not have an effective system of policing when the relationships between communities and the police are defined by fear and mistrust. We want to help them be better public servants by making it easier to remove rogue officers from amongst their midst because bad police make it impossible for good police to do their work. One of the points at the technical session of the event is human rights violation by the police. Orientation is being addressed. So the, the intent, Mr. Speaker, is to give powers to the Police Service Commission to intervene even at the level of curriculum so that we are turning around their mindset even from the get-go when they get into the police force to understand what the Constitution provides, to understand what the rights of citizens are. If I write a petition today against the MBA president that he's involved in an armed robbery in my village. The first mode of operation will be to arrest the MBA president before investigation starts. What does that tell you? That he's actually guilty. He now has to prove himself innocent. The speaker bears his thoughts on the appearance of some policemen. Shed out, sometimes rubber sleepers probably very unkempt. It's kind of very difficult to look at him with the respect and authority of state. A public hearing will still be held on the proposed bill after it scales second reading in the House of Representatives. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. So that conversation happened yesterday about policing and human rights, you know, something that uh, was done uh, in collaboration with the House of Representatives, even led by the House of Representatives and the Speaker was himself there. But we have had police reforms in Nigeria since 1966. Look at this one, for instance, on the screen right now. This has happened, and the report was submitted to General Gowon recommending abolition of local police at the time. Mm. That was in 1966. Oh, yes, you recall that's when we now had one police force, in some sense, having the different regions' police coming together. Which was after, that, that was before or after the Civil War? It was before the Civil War. Oh, yeah, it was, it was during that period. So yeah. it was a time that the police had a lot of responsibility. Yes, the war was fought by the military, but they also had 
of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But take a look at what happened in 1989. There was that Admiral Myrtle and Yako Reform Committee, which was established by the government to address rising cases of insecurity. And what you'll expect is after that kind of reform, insecurity should reduce, but not quite. Mm. The reforms were implemented, but insecurity increased. Perhaps then asks the, underscores the question of the reforms and um, how long-term, how visionary mm. those reports were in the first place. In 1994, then head of state, uh, now late General Sonia Bacha, inaugurated a six-man panel headed by former Inspector General of Police, MD Yusufu, um, still on the same place. The report was never published and, of course, naturally, never implemented. Oh, fast forward to 2006. So we thought, you know what, we could do this. So the Presidential Committee on Police Reform was constituted by former President Olushe Gwambasajo. And what came out of it was a white paper which was approved by the government. But uh, a lot of people think that was not substantially implemented. Yet again, implementation. Where, which, I mean, uh, again, it goes back to, okay, so how long term was the thinking? 2012, no, no, let me take it to 2008, two years after that one, a presidential committee headed by Mohammed D. Yusuf, um, a retired IGP. He, that's the second one he seems oh, yes. to be, you know, leading there. It was constituted in January by former president, later uh, President Yaradua. Reforms were attempted, but deemed uncoordinated. Again, implementation. Yeah. And eight years ago, the presidential committee, which was chaired by Pari Asoyade, a retired DIG and chairman of a PSC at that time. Well, the committee submitted its report, but we didn't get to see the white paper. And consequently, no implementation. Well, we have had police reforms. That's the meat of the matter. How far so far? Another attempt at that is the Police Act 2020 which has made far-reaching recommendations in the law. However, is it active yet? If not, why? The president has signed it. Gazetting, what's holding it up? Then that committee, that uh, meeting that happened yesterday is actually why we are here this morning to have a conversation with two gentlemen. Um, uh, you saw some of them, the two of them in the opening slide. Honorable Henry Owauba, Chairman, Committee on Implementation and Monitoring of legislative agenda in the House of, of Representatives. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Honorable. We also have a youth thank advocate. You yes, thank you. And uh, uh, Nigerian entertainer, uh, Michael Stevens. We all know him as Rugged Man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Honorable, um, let's begin with you. Uh, give us a backstory to that meeting that took place yesterday in Abuja about policing and human rights. Uh, very good morning. Um, so first of all, to establish that the meeting that took place yesterday was driven by the House Committee uh, on the implementation uh, and monitoring of the legislative agenda of the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, if you recall, in October last year, the House had set out an agenda for itself that it would be pursuing for the life of this assembly. And upon the advent of the COVID pandemic, um, the House reconvened in, Feb in, March, in, in March to rework that document and come up with an updated agenda that looked at 10 critical sectors of uh, the economy, with the security being one of them. Uh, this was before the NSAS uh, uprising. And what we have done is that because we're living in a very dynamic, uh, you know, very, very uh, different times, we are looking at the issues that are arising in this country. If you remember that the uh, part three, uh, section 30, A and B of the 1999 constitution, the police service commission actually has the authority to recruit uh, and to also look at um, disciplinary issues in the Nigerian police force. Uh, essentially, the objective what we're looking at now is to see how we can establish a more effective and a, perhaps a responsive framework that will conduct the, uh, the that will govern the operations of police in, in, in Nigeria. And then, of course, uh, secondly, 
look at the, the, the structure and composition of the board of the Police Service Commission and, uh, and hopefully dovetail into the operations on ground, especially when it comes to human rights abuses uh, in terms of uh, the way uh, complaints are laid, the way they are acted upon and the time frame they have to conclude investigations. All of that has happened and um, there are still a good number of questions to ask. So that led to the meeting of yesterday. But then that's not the first of it that we have had over time. You have, must have listened to the intro that we gave of a number of uh, police reforms that we have had since 1966 until today. And yet what has been consistent in all of it is implementation of the reports of such meetings, such investigations, such um, attempts at reforming the police. What hopes do we have that this will be any different? Okay, so for the first time, uh, we're actually tracking the things that we set out to achieve for ourselves. Um, you know, the bill making uh, or lawmaking cycle usually starts from when a bill is listed on the floor for first reading. What we're doing now is we're expanding this process. Uh, what we've actually had is a zero draft. Uh, it's not a bill yet. What we're trying to do is get every relevant person on board to stop this uh, trend of completing an exercise and then it, it ends up being an exercise in futility. So we are essentially con you know, talking with all these relevant stakeholders so that when the train moves and we start with the bill making on this uh, reform, we're not going to look back. We're not going to leave anything to chance. Everything would have been uh, considered. All relevant opinions would have been taken. And then it would sail, get a presidential uh, accent and become law. We believe that we will never get tired of, of uh, you know, engaging. This is what we do as parliament. Uh, this is what we're elected to do. We're elected to interrogate uh, status quo. We're elected to ask questions. We will continue to do the work. Uh, there will be challenges, but it, it's not going to deter us. On this uh, zero draft that we have, we have put together a crack team of stakeholders, of professionals. We have the Nigerian Bar Association. We have the Human Rights Commission. We're working with the Police Service Commission itself. And all of these intake, all of these input are aimed at getting together a draft that would carry the, uh, or aggregate the collective thoughts of the people that, are, that matter in this conversation. So that when we start to make the law, we know that we have something that is already carrying everybody, everybody's opinion. Uh, we believe that this is going to be different. We believe that it's going to be signed. Uh, we believe that uh, it's, it's a bill whose time has come. It's necessary. If you look at what's happening in the country today, uh, the, the, the issues of human rights are, are germane. Um, people have said to us that if, if you take the Nigerian policeman on international duties, uh, you see that him excelling. But when you put the same policeman in Nigeria, um, there are gaps and there are questions. And so what seems to be the problem? These are some of the things that we need to look at and we need to continuously engage ourselves in the lawmaking process, especially with the people that we oversight. Because ultimately, we believe that a very good police force is one of the critical things needed in this country to maintain a certain level of decency in the system. Uh, Honourable, uh, this whole conversation about uh, human rights, you know, increased now uh, as a result of um, issues raised by young people in the country. So far, I haven't heard you say how, what kind of interventions, what kind of conversations, what kind of engagement you are having with the young generation in the country who you know make up some 60 to 70 percent of Nigeria's population. Let's look at the, 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 the procedure. Let's look at, we'll start from the composition of the Police Service Commission. The Constitution actually provides for a nine-member board. We will activate the full uh, the membership of the board, and we're going to bring in people that are stakeholders in human rights and policing activities in Nigeria. Uh, groups like the Nigerian Bar Association will now be on the board of the Police Service Commission. 
the Human Rights Commission itself will be on the board. Even the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, ICPC, we're proposing a board chairman that would, uh, his tenure will be for a fixed term of five years. So he's going to be f uh, fixed and he will not be distracted with looking for re uh, reappointment. And of course, there's going to be a woman on the board and it must be a woman that is vested and well uh, um, knowledgeable about domestic violence and violence against women. And of course, uh, when you, you come to the police complaints procedure itself, what we're looking at now is a way that the Police Service Commission will have representatives uh, or offices in the 30, 36 states. Um, we're looking at a, a, a complaints procedure that would not necessarily rely on the police force itself. It, it, it will be a situation where you can imagine the kind of uh, um, justice you will get if you go to a police service where the, the officer that is accused of uh, human rights violation is the same police station where you go to turn in your complaint. What we're saying is that the Police Service Commission should be able to coordinate the process of uh, collecting all the, um, uh, the human rights violations and then obviously go through a process of investigation. And while that investigation is going on, the, uh, the police officer that is being accused of whatever the violations are will be removed from customer facing duties and put on a back office role, maybe a desk duty, remove the gun. You don't empower a policeman who has been accused of human rights violation uh, uh, and still keep him on the beat. But the critical thing to point out is that this bill is actually going to be, in terms of the mode of engagement, it's going to be a bill that will be good for the police and also for the accusers, for the citizens. We are looking at a fair process that will protect the policeman while investigations are going on and also give confidence to the complainants that, look, this system is going to be transparent, it's going to be outside of the police control, and there will be a recommendation at the end. It's not just looking at the young people of Nigeria. I think that uh, human rights violations cut across. We have elders, we have politicians, we have pressmen, we have the youth, we have everybody in Nigeria has uh, at one time, or hopefully this bill would be actually something that we're putting in for Nigerians, regardless of whether they're youths or whether they're, as long as you're a Nigerian, this bill seeks to protect you from human rights abuses from the police. Clearly, this sounds like a marathon, not a sprint, because for a lot of people, they're thinking, how soon can we get those wins? But let's bring this back uh, to Lagos. Uh, join Rugged Man, Mr. Stevens. I, I know you did the song, This Police Your Friend. Yes, uh, I did. And for a lot of young Nigerians, uh, they see you as that, that link between themselves and the police. In fact, some say you're probably an ambassador, but you've since said, <laughs> said you're not an ambassador. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, seeing what the House of Representatives is trying to achieve, you've probably seen the judicial panels all across. You've seen the way the president has responded, the vice president. I mean, aggregating all of this together, do you think this is what the police needs to become the friend of a Nigerian? On paper, yes. On paper, yes. All I've heard right now sounds really good. But on the streets right now, no. Mm. What people need right now, especially the youth, yes, he just said, um, the Honorable just said it's not um, just the youth, it's uh, even politicians, and I really love for him to show me a politician that's been manhandled by the police. But um, the youth are the people who face these policemen on the streets every day, especially because a lot of them do not have jobs. So they get to move around a lot, you understand? So what people need right now is less talk and more action. For me, to, sorry to sound like a radio station. You know, what people need is less talk and more action. Because as I speak to you, okay, we know the situation the country is in. We know what we're just recovering from the NSARS protest and everything. And unfortunately, uh, I, I need to point out something. It's not just SARS. It's not just SARS. There's also anti-kidnapping, then there's anti-courtism. These are uh, two other squads that were doing the same thing. It's just unfortunate that SARS was the most popular. So everybody picks on SARS. You know, so when they say NSARS, NSARS, right now, I feel the anti-courtism, anti-kidnapping are just hiding somewhere, hoping we don't remember them. But we remember you. You were part of this 
problem. You understand? So what the people need is, yes, I'm okay with the panels being set up, but panels have been set. You already you started from 1960, what? 66. Right? To this is 2020. Uh, you know, the, the, the question I would also like, like to ask you is, I know you've interfaced a lot of times I, I between remember. young people and the police. And yes, we go back to 1966. Some will tell you it started way before then. I mean, mm -hmm. when the colonial masters and court came, introduced this, and then there were issues. But why does it seem as though the Nigerian police force has defied reforms over the years? How hard really is it to reform the Nigeria police? It's not hard. Anything that seems to defy reform, it only means that there are some people high up somewhere that are benefiting from the chaos, that are benefiting from the crimes being committed. So until you remove those people, there will probably be no reform because they will be the ones always kicking against any type of reform that will stop them getting the monies they get. That's why I said people need more action than talk. Right now, as we speak, we know what we're just trying to recover from. Two days ago, that was from the whole police brutality and everything. Then two days ago, I saw videos of task force and Okada riders at mile two. And then yesterday, I saw the video, another video of task force against Okada riders in Ikeja along. And I posted it yesterday and said, with the situation of the country right now, is this the right time to be engaging Okada riders who are among the people that have been brutalized, extorted, who are hungry, who are angry. But you won't also take it away, rugged man, that, mm -hmm. you know, in every society, we always have people who want to take advantage of the system, defy yeah. the authorities and stuff like that. And that's, okay. okay. You, you know, of course, that there are times when these Okada riders, for instance, just for instance, mm -hmm. they drive against traffic a good number mm -hmm. of times. They, you know, defy the laws of the land, they do things that they are not supposed to do and which has resulted in, in them being taken away from major highways and certain yeah. areas of the country and okay. stuff like that, which is the reason perhaps why the task force is asking them to get off, off the places or areas where they have been taken away from. Okay. So in that light, one wouldn't say that the task force is doing the wrong thing when they are only trying to enforce the law. Uh, look at it this way. We need to be smart in everything we, we, we're doing in life. We need to have empathy. And then one thing I always tell the police and I tell the people, especially the police because they are the authorities, communication is key. Communication is key. Do these bike men know what they're doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Why I'm saying this is because I can't walk up to you and just do an Okada man. His Okada is everything. is his life. Once he sees a uniformed officer coming towards him, he's losing money or he's losing his bike that day. God forbid, with the way things have been going, he's losing his life. So as far as he's concerned, he will do anything to protect his bike. Now, what we need is communication between the task force, the police, and the people. You need to enlighten these people. You need to let them know. And look, we don't have to wait until uh, campaign periods before we start running adverts on TV and on radio telling people how to vote and where to vote. You can also run campaigns telling Okada men, bus drivers, where to go to and where not to go to. Okay, let me talk to, take you up on a constituency you are, you know, as passionate about, which is the youth. Um, you've heard the Honourable say some things about, you know, what government is doing, especially legislatively. There have also what been government some... government is talking about doing? Well, government has done some things. Which is? SARS has been ended. Uh, judicial panels have been set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are sittings going on, and hopefully the reports will be communicated and given to the federal government to take appropriate action. Amen. Okay, those actions are going on. What kind of engagement? Because clearly from what you're saying now, it will look like the trust deficit between the people and you know, the youth. Uh, the government and the youth is gone, or is depleted. Mm -hmm. What kind of engagement do you think would persuade the young generation, especially the youth now, being the ones, you know, that pretty much raise these issues now. What kind of engagement do you expect and how should government be engaging them? Government should engage them the way fathers, mothers, the way elders will engage their children. They should stop trying to bully them. That's one thing. That's why I keep saying communication. They should stop trying to bully them. They should stop trying to think that the youth do not know what's happening or aren't intelligent. They are very. 
You know, the government needs to understand that these young people, this is 2020, we're moving on 2021. What some of these young people know today, even them, the government do not know it. You understand? So they need to, the government needs to be very transparent. The time has passed where you just come out and say, oh, we'll do this. And then that's it. Because people never forget. It's not, the only, it's not only the internet that never forgets. People never forget. You reeled out a couple of panels from 1960 to 2020 and not, that nothing came out of. So right now, a lot of young people are sitting at, at home, jobless, schoolless, because ASU is still doing the striking more than Zeus these days. So they're sitting at home and they're watching another panel, another sitting. Not what has come out from the other ones, nothing. So obviously a lot of them right now believe nothing will come out of this. So what the government needs to do, if there's enough from one of the panels, if there's enough proof, even if it's one or two officers that have been found guilty, let it be made public and let the prosecution process take, start taking place immediately. But we have had that, right? We have heard. We have had that. Who? You interface, you know, sizably with the police. Yes, you right. would know that, you know, the commissioner of police, for instance, in Lagos, recently, you know, made an announcement of people who have been removed, dismissed. And we've also heard from the, you know, federal government at the federal government level the police at the center saying that these actions have happened not just in the in abuja city it ha they have happened in various states can and I, communities in the nation yeah just like you said we have heard they have said but we've not seen that's what i mean by communication we have been hearing and they have been saying for what years we want to see they have we need dismissed to see. some how do we know how do we confirm where do we go to be sure let me give you a quick example God rest his soul. Um, Colady Johnson was shot and killed by an officer um, last year. The case has been in court. It has been adjourned almost till today. But if a young Nigerian does, he's, is caught on the road, maybe with a small stick of a substance or something, he goes to court immediately and he's sentenced. You see, that's, you see the difference? Now, that's what I'm talking about. His, there's no evidence to prove that that was found on him. Mm -hmm. But the officer who shot Colored Johnson has even opened his mouth, confessed that he shot. And it happened in broad daylight. But the case is still in court over a year. I, you know, the, the sense that the government is given now is things are different. I mean, you've, seen the, you've talked about the judicial sense. panel. We don't but want sense. In the space of this past few weeks, I mean, from just before the NSAS protests, mm -hmm. during and after, because you talked about transparency, we'll go to break quickly, but I'd like no, to, to touch on that. You mm -hmm. talked about transparency. Is there anything you have seen in the space of this few weeks that has told you, well, maybe the government is not being transparent enough? Um, yeah, well, for the Lagos panel, I, there was a document that came out about, uh, they wanted them to not dis disclose anything that happens within the panel to the public. Now, why would you want to do that for a panel that's supposed to be for the people? The panelists refused, mm. and then it was struck up. Now, okay. that was not a good sign. Well, we'll, we'll, pr we'll probably need a lawyer to understand that, but then we'll come back <laughs> to, <laughs> to No, the document was actually put out. It was yeah, on, I, on, I, like, I, I, Everyone, sorry, but we'll, let, let's yeah. take a break for now to take a few messages. We'll be right back to continue the conversation. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, well, this conversation is an ongoing one. Honorable Wauba, well, you have heard um, Michael Stevens, Mr. Michael Stevens, and um, one of the things that's underscored in all he has said is that the trust deficit is depleted. All people hear is, we're going to do it, and then, you know, Sometimes they even t it even takes off, and then within a short time, uh, we just seem to go back to square one. Again, the question, how do we rebuild that trust deficit between the people and the government? So, um, in the first place, um, all the interventions that you've seen in the past at police reforms have all been executive interventions, all of them. Um, what we are trying to do is to actually expand the base. We are trying to, first of all, cement the executive-legislative relationship 
we have had seminars with the executive, we have had interaction with the executive, we have all identified the need to be on the same page. And to the point I made earlier on, when you talk about police reforms, police reforms affect one and all. As long as you're a Nigerian, any institutional reform of the police force will likely affect you in one way or the other. And that's the point that I was making. In the composition of the, the, the proposal, the, in the draft bill, we have actually I've made just provision said now, for a youth. It, just a moment. A youth, yeah. oh, not uh, more uh, than uh, age uh, of 35. You will expatiate on that for a bit. Yes, just a moment. A you will expatiate on that. Just, just a moment, Honorable. Yeah. I was going to take you up on the fact that, you know, when you said it's uh, human rights against one, it's human rights against all, not just the youth. I agree. And you're about to expatiate the fact that, you know, the youth have also been, you know, factored into the conversations that you're having. But don't forget that over, the, over time, this matter of human rights abuses had been going on. There have been attempts to raise conversations about police reforms, especially because it's the younger people that seem to be a little more susceptible. There have been others, yes, but this issue was exacerbated recently by the youth in this country. That is why I'm asking, is there any engagement happening between government, especially from the National Assembly, and the youth? Because eventually, these youth will grow up out of the youth bracket. So is there any engagement now that is sustainable? Nothing will please this parliament more than this proposed engagement that you're talking about. What we have done is taken the initiative to commence a process with legislation. Of course, we're open to further uh, interaction with the youth in any, any way this, the, 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 the conversation can be structured and, and you know, can be had. On, over the weekend, we actually, preparatory to the event that we had yesterday on this uh, draft bill uh, seeking to reform the police, we actually had a Zoom meeting with all the, the youths that we could get into the database, into the, into the scope of the conversations that we're having. The House of Representatives is seeking to position itself as a pro-people house as a pro people uh, parliament we want to see uh, these kind of interactions that we can aggregate the, the collective opinions of the youths and use them in policy making we want to position the house of representatives as an engine room for innovation in policy we are available um, but right now the conversation on the table is what can we do in terms of the police reforms that will resonate positively with the youths. And we have not even started the bill making process, but we have expanded the, 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 the cycle to, to even start conversations and dialogues that will be meaningful at the end of the process. What you saw needs? yesterday was a situation where we had a representation Honorable. from the youth body. Yeah. Uh, we understand the need to have a, a body of law backing these reforms. It's quite important. But we just had the, the Police Act, which was signed into law. And if you look at some of the provisions, you see that it's almost like a duplication of the ACJA. It's almost word for word. Now, if we're going to have the PSC reform bill, I believe uh, that's, that's what it is called. How different will it be from the Police Act, maybe the ACJA? Because over time, we've seen duplications, and you wonder... Just minute differences. So how much of a game changer will this be? This is a repeal and reenact act of the Police Act of 2001. What we seek to do is a structural amendment that will reflect and will see the changes in the way they conduct their uh, actions with particular emphasis on human rights abuses. What we're trying to achieve is to see a fair uh, level or terms of engagement, both for the police and for those that are being accused or, or, or the accusers. We think that when a policeman is killed in line of duty, it's unfortunate. A policeman, don't forget, is also a Nigerian. He has families, he has uh, uh, children, he has, he's, he's basically a human being. So we're trying to look at the issues from a balanced perspective and put in enabling legislation that will be fair for all. What this is strictly looking at is one, the way and manner that officers conduct themselves with regard to human rights abuses. We also want to see 
uh, a police complaint procedure that is independent, not just in intent, but on ground. We want to make it easier for Nigerians to bring their complaints out. So we are setting up 37 police uh, service commission offices across Nigeria. It is quite uh, unfortunate as it is today. You see uh, people coming in from outside of uh, station to travel long distances to make their reports. We also want to enable electronic ways of capturing uh, human rights violations, just like you have uh, in developed countries where you have uh, body cameras on policemen to capture crime as they are being committed or uh, violations as they are being committed. We want to be able to act uh, documentary evidences as well as electronic evidences. Uh, you can uh, record using your mobile phone or camera. In any way you gather the, the, um, the evidence, it will be accepted. We're right. also opening up the of institutions that can prosecute will include the EFCC, uh, the Attorney General of the States of the Federation. So if, if I got that uh, well, did you say, uh, Honorable, par pardon me, did you say that policemen might be having body cams? Is that what you said? No, what I'm saying is that we're trying to allow electronic uh, uh, evidences to be gathered so that if, if for, for instance, there's an incident on the street and somebody has a mobile phone and recording those mobile phones, that footage can be accepted and sent in. Uh, right. We haven't reached, uh, Nigerian police hasn't reached uh, the level where, you know, we can equip them with, with we have serious gaps in terms of uh, funding the, the police and all of that, but that's a different conversation. That's a huge issue but, also so about funding. That but, police reforms. Uh, pardon me. So we can do this, I mean, have a robust conversation. I understand Rugged Man uh, has to respond to some of the issues you have raised. I mean, he's also representative of the young people. So maybe these are some of the representations and conversations you would like uh, on that, your committee. So you've listened to some of the issues he raised. Yes. Do you want to respond? I, to I was just about to say, um, Honorable, you know that a hungry man does not know respect. An angry man does not know uh, rule of law or human rights. Where I'm taking this to is, I appreciate everything you said about um, what, you know, the plans you have for the police, but you've not touched on one very, very important part, and that's funding the police, their salaries, their health care, the education of their children, the accommodation where they live. These are things you have to put in place. These are things that determine the mentality of the police officer that gets on the street that people like myself and these young people meet every day. Yes, you're talking about how to punish the bad ones, but you've not said anything about rewarding the good ones. And then you've not talked about paying them what they're supposed to be paid properly. That's the funding part. And then uh, there's this, I'll quickly also give you this idea, which I've said a lot of times, both online and to some good officers that I know. You just said uh, Nigeria, hasn't, Nigeria hasn't gone to the level where it, uh, you can fund them enough to have body cams. I'm sorry, sir, but that is an embarrassing statement to make on national TV. We know how much Nigeria is worth. We know how much our budget is. If the security is not taken seriously enough to even give the police a body cam, come on. That's a serious issue. But to solve your body cam issue um, real quickly, I keep saying this. If you have a group, if you have a six-man, five-man squad that wants to go out for an operation, not, not an armed robbery shootout case. I mean, if they're going to investigate something or interact with somebody, Put a sixth man, let that sixth man's only job be to have a camera, to have a phone. It's easy to get. You have a small one. So that immediately they get to where they're going to, once they step out of the car, the, that the person starts recording and they state their names. I am so, 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 so. We're heading to see so, so, so. So they record every step till they interact with the person. If there's any resistance, they do, they handle the issue so that. That is video evidence, okay. so that when they get to the station, it is it not fine. just the officer's word against the I, 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 I'll take that as your, your, your recommendation on this matter. But uh, Honorable, very quickly, you want to react to that, so we can close. Um, first of all, the police reforms that is being pursued by the Ninth House of Representatives is a series of reforms. We have taken the first uh, reform that was signed by the President. We're proposing this reform now with the Police Service Commission. And the third uh, bill that is coming is actually looking at the welfare of the police, strictly and holistically, 100%.
I do agree with you. There are so much gaps in, in, in policing in, in Nigeria. Uh, but the point I was making was not uh, the point of uh, trying to embarrass Nigeria or embarrass the police force. We do need more funding to go into the police. We do need more equipment to go into the police. We do need, need more air, air cover. Nigerian police should have a, a thriving marine uh, water police air police, helicopters, body cams, more vehicles. I agree with all of that. What I am saying is that this particular bill is looking at infractions of human rights on ground, and we're saying we will accept a digital and electronic evidence in the absence of body cams on police, just like we have in other crimes. On the issue of welfare, I really think it's an embarrassment. We have had reports. Uh, let me just put this up. We have had reports of uh, policemen uh, uh, serving for maybe 10, 15 years with only one allocation of uniforms. We have had reports of policemen dying in active service and within uh, a few weeks, the family is evicted from, from, the, from the house where they're staying. We have had reports of the salary structure of the police. So we're coming with a comprehensive bill that will be a police welfare bill that is going to look at all of these issues. Where we have a lot to do from a legislative perspective, mm. but right. one thing I can assure Nigerians is that this house is poised, is willing, and is available. We are available as a committee to work Honorable. with you, rugged man. We work with your the youths. We are. Uh, we don't have all the answers. What we want Honorable, to do is we, we have only to we have only attempted to begin this conversation. And um, now that you have uh, made an appeal for rugged man to come join your committee, well, perhaps he will also be you will also be contacting him afterwards. So we have to thank you very very much for your time. By the way. Um, uh, uh, there is an appeal that a number of people are making, uh, rugged man, uh, that the youth should please give government a chance. What appeal would you be making to the youth now? Just so that they can just give government a little bit of a chance to at least redeem some of the promises that they have made. I, don't, I actually don't think... Um, okay, well, well, let me put it this way. Communication, yes? Who's making the appeal? Who's making the appeal and how are they making the appeal? First, something I said, uh, first, second day of this, of the protest, I said, imagine if the IG of police had actually come on, TV, on air and announced that he was sending at least 100 or 200 policemen to each protest venue to protect the protesters. That would have been a great way because you know Nigerians, no matter how hard we want to say we are, we're still wonderful people. Okay. The next thing you see is pictures with... Of so for you, police. it is trust. It trust. Is communication. Communication. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, I have to thank you very much, uh, Michael Stevens, also known as Rugged Man. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. And Honorable Henry Wawuba, Chairman, Committee on Implementation and Monitoring of Legislative Agenda at the House of Representatives. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Thank you.